Once again, welcome to Bethany EFC. I see a lot of uh, familiar faces and also new faces. We welcome you. And after this service, please stay behind for a time of fellowship of food and of laughter and fun as well as I get to know you better and the members get to know you better as well. Before we begin, let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Let's pray. Our loving, gracious Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we are people with hope in a world that is dying without hope. And we know that we bring this light and hope to the nations. And because of that, Father God, help us to understand your word, to apply it, and to live it out each day of our lives, starting from understanding this passage today. Thank you, Father God, for we ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Today, I want to talk about reconciliation and about God's promises. We know that both reconciliation and God's promises, claiming God's promises, require faith. Faith, especially in the uncertainties of life. Faith, especially in unseen things of life. God has ordained it such. In, in fact, Scripture tells us, Hebrews 11 um, verse 1, the great faith chapter tells us, faith, it begins like that, faith is assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things unseen or not seen. That requires us to have faith in God's promises. And this is especially important when we consider the uncertainties in life, the disruptions in life, and the brokenness of life itself. And as we come to the tail end of this series, this 11 sermon series, we want to ask ourselves this question, how can we reconcile with people whom we have broken relationships with the way that God intended it to be? This is the final sermon. Some of you have been following this closely. Some of you are sighing a relief. I hope this series has brought you an your family and those whom you have pointed to, um, to follow this series, uh, some kind of closure. And today, in this particular sermon itself, we know that Joseph has gone through a lot of things. He was betrayed. He was sold off by his brothers. He was tempted, but he didn't succumb to temptation. And because of that, he was jailed. And he was forgotten. All these things happened to him before he was finally being elevated, empowered and entrusted by Pharaoh to lead Egypt out of this famine that they are in right now. Through it all, he witnessed how each and every one of his dreams, which comes in pass, were being literally fulfilled. First, his two dreams of his brothers bowing and even his father bowing to him the dreams of the cupbearer, and of course, the baker, and finally, Pharaoh's own two dreams. And because of his fulfillment of those dreams, he was elevated from a prisoner to a prime minister, from a prison itself to the palace, and of course, from a slave to the saviour, especially to his family. Joseph, through it all, remained faithful. He remained righteous, he remained tenacious, and he remained gracious, especially to his own family. Now his family is finally reunited and now living in the land, the fertile delta uh, river of this place called Goshen. And of course, we know that in the earlier chapter, and in fact, the verses before this, we know that his father, Jacob, has gone home to be with his God. And he is now older, wiser, more powerful. And because of that, we ask ourselves this question, you know, what will happen what will happen to Joseph and his brothers, especially his brothers? Will, will Joseph really forgive and forget his, his brothers' transgressions against him? After all, 
He's the most powerful man now, apart from Pharaoh. Will he seek retribution, retaliation, or will he have reconciliation? We want to learn from Joseph, his responses, as well as the responses of his brothers, how we should reconcile God's way, how we can get back into a right relationship with one another, and especially with God himself. I know some of us have struggled in our relationships. And I want you to think back for a moment. Is there a relationship that is broken right now in your family, in your office, in your life? Some of us have held those brokenness, this betrayed feelings, wrong, being wrongly accused, you know, those kind of tensions with us for many, many years. And I want to speak into that situation right now. I want you to think of that relationship that's broken. And I want you to ask yourself this question. How can we reconcile God's way? Now, we want to see, first and foremost, Joseph's brothers. Now, if you are Joseph's brother, or his, his brothers here, what would you be doing right now? What would you feel? How would you feel? Because... Daddy is dead, right? Daddy Jacob is dead right now. And we know that this little brother, Joe, we call him Joseph, Joe, is a big wig right now in Egypt. He's the second most powerful man. And we haven't been too nice. Let me change the mic. Mic test. We haven't been too nice to him when he was 17 years old. And because of that, will he now turn the tables around and get back to us? After all, we do not know whether he is doing so, he was being nice to us because the father was still around. And now the father is no longer around, will he take revenge? And so, if I'm the brothers, if, if I, I were one of them, what would I be doing? I'll be thinking of a few things, right? First and foremost, I will be very scared. I'll be scared stiff. I'll be sleepless at night. And of course, I'll be thinking of my exit strategy. You know, I'll be secretly planning for that exit strategy. Now, if I were one of the brothers, let's, let's just randomly choose some of them, right? Shall we? These are the brothers of Joseph. Remember last week, you know, we, we saw this. And we have asked ourselves this question. So, what will they be thinking of? And let's start with just Reuben himself. If I am Reuben, the firstborn, I will say something like this to Joseph. Hey, you know, bro, <laughs> uh, I, I really tried to dissuade them from, you know, killing you. You remember, you know, they threw you in, into that pit, you know. I, I, I was the one who said, don't kill him. Let's not shed blood. Now, if I'm Simeon, the second born, what would I say? I'll, I'll say something like this. Hey, don't forget, uh, you went to prison. I also did, you know. I, I, I went in as well. And, you know, uh, my brothers uh, left me here and, and they went back. I, I have to suffer here. Actually, he didn't. He was on house arrest. Right? And if you are Judah, what would you say? You say something like, you know, you know bro, again, you know, hey, didn't I offer my life uh, for, for Benny, you know, Benjamin? And, um, you know, I, you, you can see that I, I'm, I'm a generous person, you know, I, I'm a man of my word. So if you're the brothers, what would you do? What would you do when you have a conflict, when you have an unreconciled relationship? You see, the brothers did what they knew and they have learned to do through their fathers and through their great-grandfather even. They cook up a story, right? And this is what we hear from verses 15 all the way down to eight, uh, 17. And of course, they did all these things. They said to Joseph, first they sent a delegate in just to test water. Then after that, they came after they knew that nothing has happened to that messenger that they sent. I hope it wasn't Benjamin that they sent to Joseph. Scripture didn't tell us. But this is what they did. 
You see, this is where I want to point out to us the very first thing that we can learn from the responses of the brothers of Joseph. To be reconciled, to be properly reconciled God's way, we need to come clean. That means we need to come clean for both parties as well. When we are really guilty, we'll try to get rid of the guilt, right? When we're dirty, we'll try to wash it off. When we're hungry, we feed our hunger. When we are guilty, we will try to get rid of it. We, we need to, first and foremost, come clean. But we can also come clean with a lot of caveats and conditions. And this is exactly what happened to the brothers of Joseph. Nowhere, if you think about it very carefully, nowhere did Scripture or even Jacob record for us in his dying moments to command especially Joseph, to forgive his brothers. And if you were to read the earlier chapter, which we covered last week, do you remember all the pronouncements and the prophecies that Jacob said to his sons? Jacob did all that he, he did, right? And said all that he said. And the thing is this, if you read through all these things, you see that Jacob was very blunt with his sons. He called a spade a spade. He called a sin a sin. He even told Reuben, I remember your illicit affair with my wife. And so therefore, I find it very hard to believe that Jacob would have said this in the absence of Joseph. In Chinese, what the brothers did was what we call zuo zhe, xing xu, meaning to say you're guilty. And when you're guilty, you try to cover up your guilt. No, and I always say this to people, you know, especially my students, don't be insecure because insecure people do stupid things. And the brothers did a very stupid thing. They thought too little of Joseph. So there's no ifs, no buts, no maybes. To reconcile, we need to come clean. But the reality of life is this, that many of us lack the courage to come clean and address a problem as it is, calling a spade a spade, a sin a sin. Whether you are the offending party or whether you have been offended, most of us will want to sweep it underneath the carpet and pretend nothing has happened or at least delay it until later on. Kick the can, as what the Americans say. Kick the can down the road. But this is not what God wants us to do in order for us to be properly reconciled. For Joseph's brothers, remember, if you read what we, we read in, in verses 15 to 17, guess what they said? They said all the right things, right? They said words like evil, transgression, sin, forgive us, we are your servants. And this is another thing. Coming clean does not mean that we use all the right words because right words does not right the wrong. All the right words may not right the wrong because why? There's always caveats and there's always conditions. You are not saying the right thing. It's important to admit your mistakes and to accept people's mistakes, but it is not the way, what I call the Jacob way. Or even, if you think about it, Abraham's way. Before he was called Abraham, he was called Abram. And this is exactly what Jacob did. No, they, they did this. They said, Daddy said this. And what I call the Jacob thing is calculating, cheating, conniving, a crafty conspiracy just to deceive Joseph. And so, this is what they did. They said, Daddy said, nah, before he died, nah, you must forgive us, you know. I remember very clearly <clears throat> when my grandmother died, um, she had some jewelry, all right? She had some jewelry, not a lot, but some jewelry. And because my grandma had stayed with me 
uh, even though my dad and mom passed away already, she stayed with me. And then subsequently, she stayed with my sister as well. So the first thing they, my, my aunts came to us is that your grandma had uh, this jewelry. She said that it belongs to me. Have you had that kind of experience before? You know, um, and for me, I, my, and my sisters, we, we, we don't really care for how much monetary worth it is. But for some of my aunts, it was very important. And so we gave everything, but I, my only request is give me the smallest thing there, just as a token of memory for my grandma. They didn't. <laughs> they didn't give to me. But it's okay, I was the youngest, so I, I, I cannot complain. But you see, this is where we see the brokenness of this family. We need to understand that to be reconciled, we need to come clean. Many of us do not have the courage to do so. And I'll speak about that courage later on. But that is the brother's response. And we can learn something from their response, their negative example. But now we want to see what is Joseph's response. If you were Joseph, what would you do? What would you really do? No, after all, you're the most powerful man. You have the means, especially the motivation to make them very miserable. What would you do? Now, many of you may not know this, but in Joseph's days, the Egyptians liked to do this to their enemies. They don't kill them. Obviously, they imprison them, but they like to chop off their noses. All right. Uh, if you if you go to Egypt today, it is well known during Joseph's uh, Ramesses, what we call Middle Kingdom period. Uh, you see a lot of statues with noses gone, and a lot of people thought that it was just wear and tear of the elements and all that. Until in 1960s, the archaeologists realized that this was part of the punishment. So if I'm Joseph, I'll do that. You know, I'll cut off their nose. Why cut off the nose? Somebody may be asking. Because it is not just painful, it is a constant reminder of your transgression. Everywhere you go, in fact, in, in outskirts of Goshen itself, you'll find a, a village where basically there are all the people with, without noses. They were all lopped off. And they couldn't even go anywhere else. They can only live within their own community. That was how the Egyptians punished them. And this is what I'll do if I'm Joseph. But Joseph being Joseph, he did not do those things, thankfully. Instead, we read in Scripture in verse 18b, he said, Joseph wept when they spoke to him. He cried. In fact, this is where I want to bring us to the next point. From Joseph's response, we can learn something very precious. And that is to reconcile. We need to surface our sorrows. We need to admit that we have been hurt. Many of us are unable to do so partly because of shame, partly because of the way we are being brought up to suppress our emotions. By the way, this is not the first nor the second time that Joseph wept. We know that there were at least seven times, if you count it the way I, I've counted it, there's at least seven times that Joseph wept most of which are privately, but later on, when he met up, finally confessed or, or opened up to his brothers, he wept out loud, so much so that even Pharaoh's um, household could hear them crying. And this does not mean that Joseph is a crybaby, you know. He loves to cry. Everything cry, cry. In fact, I want us to see that Joseph did not remain stoic, that stiff upper lip. Recently, we witnessed on last Monday one of the grandest and most, um, how should I say, viewed funeral in the world, Queen Elizabeth II. And I, I couldn't help but notice as well that there were many people, especially Queen Elizabeth's immediate family, were there, but they were all, as the British says, the stiff upper lip. You know, they, they, they didn't express much emotions. The cameramen, especially those who are in those gossip 
uh, TVs and, and magazines and all that were trying very hard to see who's the one who will be cheering. And now all they could find is are the children who were a bit sad. And that was what one BBC commentator said, Oh, they are so sad. That's all they could say. Because why? They were trained to be stoic. I want us to know this, that when we bottle up our sorrows, and we do not allow our sorrows and our hurts to surface, we will end up having a lot of issues later on. I remember when my father passed away when I was 14, I couldn't cry. I couldn't cry at all. During the funeral, my aunt beat me, you know. I said, you must cry. I couldn't cry. But it was only months later, I was just taking a lift up to my, my flat and suddenly I just broke down. Because it's finally occurred to me, I'm now an orphan. I don't have a father anymore. And that reality sank into me and that molded me and made me who I am today as well. When we do not allow our sorrows to surface, we will not be able to be healed. Our hurt needs to be heard so that healing will begin. And this is when I encourage us, I encourage us. You may not be like Joseph where you go around crying. And I, I'm not, in no way am I saying that you go around telling everybody, no, I'm hurt, I'm hurt, this person hurt me. But it is important to acknowledge, to surface those sorrows, those hurts, and to make sure that you process those feelings properly. So, to reconcile, surface our sorrows. But what else? What else did Joseph do? And this is when we realize that Joseph didn't just simply cry. <laughs> he did something else. Let me read for you verse 18. It says here, But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? Verse 20. For... As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring, about, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Again, so do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus, he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. I want us to see that Joseph surface his sorrows, but I also want us to see that he had the art of reconciliation. What do I mean by the art of reconciliation? A-R-T. From this passage, and this is when you can employ some of these uh, skills that he has done to reconcile with somebody who has offended you or has hurt you or who has betrayed you. The first thing he did was he assuaged he assuages their fears. That means he comes, he assures them, and he offers generosity to them. He said, do not fear twice. Notice that. And not only just that, he was generous enough to even assure them that I will provide, continue to provide for you. I'm not going to kick you out of Goshen. And I will also provide for your little ones. The little ones can also be translated as your future generations. That is how generous Joseph was to his brothers. He assuaged, he assured them of his generosity. And of course, if that wasn't enough, it was recorded for us that he even comforted them and spoke kindly. The word kindly can also mean gently, has the imagery of stroking the head to them. And he didn't just do that. He also reminded them of who this God is, this sovereign God. In fact, he told them, I will not play God. In fact, he asked them this question, for am I in a place of God? And later on, as we read, as he was about to die, he even reminded them of who this God is, this God who keeps his covenantal promises. So he reminded them of God, he assuaged them with generosity, and of course, he taught them. 
this precious lesson of grace. He said, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God, not me, meant it for good. He told them that even though you have done all the evil things against me, God finally had a fa final laugh. God is still sovereign and God is in control of the situation, even though the situation is so bad. So this is what he did. He did the art of reconciliation. That's what Joseph did. And so what can we learn from this? His response. And this is another lesson that I want us to learn with regards to reconciliation. That we need to surrender our rights for revenge. I know it's hard. When somebody has offended you, has hurt you, what would you do? Your natural inclination is what? Yeah, you better be careful, right? One day, someday, you, you know, you, as what my grandma said, but you kui tua tua. Make sure that you open your eyes big, big, yeah? Because why? I will come around and get back at you. And that's what the world teaches us. But not so the ways of the Lord. Here is a man who truly suffered. Here's a man who truly knew that seeking vengeance will not solve nor soothe one scarred soul. Joseph knew that in spite of all the suffering that he's gone through, in spite of all the injustices that he has suffered, he cannot be God. He cannot take things into his own hands. And verse 19 sums up that, right? He said, what? Am I in a place of God? Joseph surrendered his rights for revenge. Let me tell you this. The moment someone surrenders his rights for vengeance, that's when healing truly comes. Surrender the rights to get back. Surrender the rights to get even. That's when true reconciliation and healing comes. South Africa is known to be a place of you know, disparity and, and unfairness. The apartheid regime itself by the, South, by the whites against the blacks was gross. And of course, we can see that being duplicated around the world today in Myanmar, for example, and different parts of the world. And we see that people, when they do not surrender the rights for vengeance, tit for tat will happen. You stab me once, I stab you twice. You chop off my head once, seven more heads will come out, as what some people have said. But what Nelson Mandela said when he was released and when he won and became the president of South Africa, the first thing he said was, I forgive and I will not be God. Think about that. Because the final judgment, final judgment does not belong to us. It belongs to God. And this is where I often tell Wendy this, you know, when, when someone cuts me, you know, when I'm driving or, or cuts me in my queue or does something, I, I say that I can only but get angry. But the wrath of God is scary. And when God judges, it is, it is no joke. And so we need to leave God to do His work while we patiently wait and surrender our rights for revenge. When we truly surrender our rights for vengeance, right? We can be generous like what Joseph did. And we can be gracious as well. Not only did he promise to take care of his uh, brothers, but also his children, their children as well. I will provide, as what he says to your little ones. That is generosity. And that is grace. Because why? He did not put himself in a place of God. To reconcile, surrender our rights for revenge. So, what happened to the family, right? How did the story end? We all want a beautiful ending. Genesis started off with creation. 
You know, God created with just simply speaking into the void. And it ended with a death. And so we read from verses 22 all the way to 26 that Joseph died, verse 26, being 110 years old, and they embalmed him and he was put in a coffin. But I want us to notice two very important things in this passage. The very first thing I want us to notice is that Joseph asked his brothers to promise to carry his bones back to the promised land that's flowing with milk and honey. This is important because it sets the stage for Exodus. And if you were to read the next book after Genesis, you'll realize that that is exactly what the sons of Israel did. They carried, when they were exiting out of, after Pharaoh, another Pharaoh, finally granted them permission. That was exactly what they did. They carried Joseph's bones and brought it to Israel or to the promised land. The second thing I want you to notice is also what he said. He said that, I'm about to die, but God will visit you and bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I want us to know that Joseph, despite the fact that he will not be able to see his, the promised land, promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, held on to that promise. And that promise was literally fulf fulfilled not one or two years down the road. It was fulfilled 400 years later. You see, God's promises are never on our chronological time. God's promises are always on His, what we call, kairos time, His opportune time. And we know that in God's perfect time, the Word, God Himself became flesh and dwelt with us. And of course, what started as a tragic story of Joseph a family discord, separation, ended with the promise of deliverance, forgiveness, and reconciliation. And Joseph's story, Joseph's story is the precursor, the foreshadow of God's ultimate story. And God's ultimate story, we know, is that God wanted us to be reconciled with Him. God wanted us, and let me read for you Romans 8. Paul, 2,000 years ago, said this, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to His purpose. Verse 29, For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed in the image of of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers see the looking back at what happened to joseph and those whom he predestined he also called and those whom he called he also justified and those whom he justified he also glorified what is important for us to realize is this that Jesus Christ is our reconcil reconciler. He's the one who will bring, bridge the gap and bring us back to God. Not only just goodwill amongst men, reconciliation amongst men, but ultimately, peace with God, the Father Almighty. Jesus is the one who reconciles and delivers us from the sin and the death that we so deserved. To reconcile with God, we need the following few things. The very first thing, we need to come clean. We need to come clean to God to recognize that we have fallen short of His standards. Just as Joseph's brothers have fallen short, grossly fallen short of the standard that Joseph has set already. And also, we need to surface our sorrows, genuinely repent from our sins and not just say that it was a 
moment of discretion, a moment of you know, uh, sin, perhaps even, as many of us would have excused ourselves. We need to genuinely surface our sorrow of sins. And finally, we need to surrender our lives to Jesus Christ. Would you do that right now? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let us ask God to help us to reconcile with the brokenness that is in our lives right now. If there's someone that has offended you, or hurt you, or betrayed you, just as the brothers had to Joseph, would you tell God right now that you choose to forgive because you have been forgiven? Why don't you spend some time right now to talk to God and ask God to help you? You need to come clean and to recognize that sometimes we ourselves are the one who's offending as well. If God is speaking to you right now and asking you to come clean to, with Him, would you do that? And after you've done that, you need to surface your sorrows. I know it's hard. It's very hard for us to have the courage to even recognize our hurts, our pains, and that we have hurt other people as well. Would you tell that to God and ask that God, through the blood of Jesus, to forgive you of your sins and to forgive those who have sinned against you. That's what Jesus taught his disciples to pray. And finally, would you surrender your rights for revenge by surrendering your life to Jesus? Because we cannot base it out of our own strength. We can only do so with the strength that only Jesus could offer to us. Because He has victory over sin and over death when He rose again on the third day. Father God, I thank You that through the life of Joseph, we have learned not only just about reconciliation and forgiveness, we also learned that what it is to be a man who is after your own heart, a man who lives righteously, blamelessly, courageously, wisely. I pray, Father God, that all of us will not just look to Joseph's example, but ultimately look at Jesus, who is the fulfillment, the foreshadow that was fulfilled. And I pray that through the power of the Holy Spirit, that you will give us that courage today, starting today, to forgive and seek reconciliation. And until then, Father God, may we rest in you and your peace, your shalom be upon us. Thank you, Father God. For we ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.